Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome fellow pilots, and welcome to another episode of Star Citizen FM. My name is Dr. Hawk, and I'll be walking you through the latest episode in Wingman's Hangar, a few other announcements, as well as an interview with Michael Nightingale. So, without further ado, let's move on to the weekend review. Eric is back. We have all the crew members back from GDC, and as far as I know, nobody is MIA, and they all walked away with something interesting, as well as some industry experience, as well, and secrets that were not mentioned, sadly. While they were at GDC, they were talking about Star Citizen, sharing the ideas, basically networking with fellow developers and trying to find ways that they can accelerate and increase the uh, amount of productivity they can have on the game, as well as maybe ship out the game a little sooner than anticipated. Also, there is an interview with Brendan Jackson that will be coming up, as well as a GDC debrief with Rob Irving. While Rob was there, uh, he related and shared some of the experiences. Free-to-play games were a focus of one of the things. I know some of you are rather... Aga not... I guess the... Well, let's just be nice. Uh, some of you really hate free-to-play games or the freemium model. Uh, unfortunately, there are some meritable things that you can gather from the free-to-play model. It's not a bad business practice, and when done right, and not giving players a pay-to-win option, free-to-play works very well. In fact, I think I can cite a few games that have done it very well, where all they've sold is aesthetics. Team Fortress 2, anyway. <laughs> Um, so if Star Citizen can walk away with some sort of free-to-play elements, you know, that's some capital coming towards the uh, CIG team continuously, maybe not in a large amount, but it's still money they can put into development post-release, then I have no problem with a free-to-play model. And if they found something good to do and found out how to do it proper, then all for them. Uh, we did get a mention of something redacted. No, seriously, that's all we got was a big, shiny letters that said redacted. Something valuable must have been learned. In fact, probably a lot of things that we don't even know or can comprehend were learned about. So only in the coming weeks will we learn what they learned at GDC. Some of the smaller topics, so how to keep the content alive, so post-release, how to make sure the game is still fun to play and you don't stagnate. You know, make sure Alara and all our pirate friends still have a steady supply of rum and vodka and all that fun stuff. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. The only other tidbit I could gather was a screen of blurry code. Now, looking at this... I Wait a minute. Let's, let's turn that back a little bit. Okay, now zoom. Oh my god, it's a bug! Oh. There. Stupid, silly game humor aside, uh, yeah, there's not not a whole lot I could really gather from it. It's intentionally blurred out and sped up so that we don't see anything. But yeah, there probably are a lot of bugs, including the spider ones, so you arachnophobes are something to worry about. Sorry. Other notes, Jason Spangler was also there. He was actually one of the gentlemen who took care of a lot of the sessions for them at uh, GDC. So he was pretty much the go-to man for anyone outside of CIG that had questions about Star Citizen, etc. One of the major focuses that I gathered from that is they were meeting with the different manufacturers of you know computer software and hardware. Um, they're going to steal all the stuffs. Uh, this is particularly important given the fidelity and level of detail that Star Citizen aims to achieve. This will allow them, and in further conversations I imagine through Skype or email, 
to keep tabs on sort of the benchmark of the game to see where, you know, the technology might be in two years. You know, 2013, what will graphics cards be capable of in 2015? Like, you know, we have the GTX Titan now. What if we have the GTX Invictus, for all I know, in the future? Keyword, that's Latin for invincible. So, don't know. We could see potentially graphics cards that are already Oculus Rift capable, right out of the box, and don't require any sort of setup. So if they can find that out and keep it you know, in the know for us, then all the better. The only other snippet from that conversation was how to efficiently render objects at distance. Some of you might be al already familiar with this. When you see something at close, you know, close to you in-game, it's usually rendering at the highest quality model or the quality settings that you've selected based on your equipment, but it's you're usually seeing the best face right up close. However, a guy that's a thousand meters away, uh, they're going to swap out a lower poly model to save GPU and CPU resources so that you can render more in a bigger space and you're not slowly killing your game engine. So the fact that they're already considering this, you know, Star Citizen, it's a game in space. There's going to be things really close to you, and there's going to be things really far away from you. So if they're already getting that in place, then we can probably look forward to some pretty awesome looking assets, both near and far to us in game. That's Jason pretty much doing his job of making sure all the seams are seamless. So good on you, Jason Spangler, for making sure that I, there are no peas in my cornflakes, so to speak because nobody likes peas on their cornflakes. And I think the last note for the highlights was Brian Brewer. If you guys remember some of those uh, animations that he was working on that we didn't get to see, we got to see some of the full view animations and they're actually looking really good. They're really smooth, really articulate, just you know what we initially see. And Eric even says they want to do full performance capture. You know, kind of like what you'd see in modern day, uh, C, C, oh, see, I almost said CIG, CGI films. So limp sync, everything, you know, eyes, hair, everything that will be perfectly accurate with what the actor would be doing, which will either break the uncanny valley or look fucking awesome. So really looking forward to that, and we'll see how that comes in the future. Let's move on to the wingman cam. While we didn't get to see any toilet shots with wingman, we did get to see some of the sexy 300i with Chris Smith. It was only a few seconds, but if you pause the video above and pause me, you'll get to see some of the detailed landing gear that Chris Smith is working on. I don't know if every ship is going to have landing gear, I would assume so. Uh, I don't think they'd have anti-grav or anything, or just ships floating in the docking bay. But just if you look at the level of detail he's going for, there's even, you know, structural paneling inside the landing gear flap. And that's on the inside. That's a face that isn't rendered to the player, so to speak. That's just there to look accurate. Um, really beautiful models, really beautiful assets, nice and high poly. Now I know my laptop will melt into a puddle, so I need to go start selling my organs. But people can pretty much look forward to probably one of the highest fidelity games I've ever seen. They even had the hydraulic lines, everything in place. What would be really cool is if later we get to see the 300i and those hydraulic lines are actually articulate, like they have physics of their own, they'll bounce and sort of move and bend with the landing gear as it folds and unfolds. So that would be really cool. I'll have to bug Chris Smith about that and he'll probably just beat me with a stick and tell me to go away. So, yeah, we we'll can look forward to probably the whole 300i later. I'll wait, though, a side note, though, anyone that is familiar with 3DS Max or wants to know what it is, that is the same program that they're using in that particular picture or video feed. So, in the coming months, when you, if you want to start making ships 3DX Max, there's, there's a few other graphics programs out there, but just start playing with it, you know? If you want to get your ships out there, that's nothing. It doesn't hurt to just get started and, you know, make a poly, even if it's just a flying box. Eric flew around a little bit more, and actually, I did notice that they had some soundproofing like conference room. But other than that, we didn't get to see too much or anything really of note. 
Uh, there should be a comment I have shown. This was up from the forums. No offense to the gentleman, I can understand, but I've said this before. <sighs> this game is a big effort. We need to be patient. We're not going to be getting juicy thigh bones every single week, and even Wingman has to remind us that things will take time. You know, that 300 eye, he said, you know, four or five weeks of development, that's a lot of time for a single asset. So, patience will be rewarded in the future, and I'm pretty sure we can look forward to some pretty badass looking assets. However, with most of the review out of the way, we could now move on to forum feedback. Our first questionee is Slow Reflex, and he's asking, Will you announce in advance which events you will be attending in the future? Hopefully so fans may attend with you guys as well. For example, anyone that wanted to see them at uh, GDC. Uh, Eric, as far as we know, yes, they're going to be trying to make plans in advance, so any of you that want to fly down and give Wingman or any of the guys a big ol' hug or a box of booze, you'll be able to do that. There was a mention of something for Golden Ticket members. I don't know what that exactly means, so we'll probably find out more. The biggest thing you guys want to be paying attention for is Gamescom. It will be coming up in the following weeks. Reebok was the next to ask. Uh, if anyone's familiar with the engineering ship dock, his question is relation to will ship sensors be similar in that you can also tweak and upgrade them with the rest of your ship? Since even I, when I was reading that, there was no mention of that anywhere. Good question, Reebok. As far as Eric's concerned, it's still being in, you know, still being developed, designed, balanced. Right now, they're pretty knee deep in asset creation, so. We'll probably find out more of that in the future, but if I were to be a betting man, and I'm not, I would say that they are. You will be able to mess up, you know, your sensors. Even Eve, you could have gravitational or whatnot. So I don't see why I couldn't do it here. Next question came from Tharse, and he asked a question I think all of us are concerned about. Will every energy weapon be named laser? Or will there be different technologies, etc.? Why not just have laser, man? Like, what's wrong with lasers? Jeez, what is this, the 2000s? Uh, <laughs> no, of course, Eric said there will be different kinds of weapons, neutron beams, lasers, plasma, x-ray, I don't know, I'm starting to guess here. And there, as we found out before, there will even be other kinds of weapons, you know, missiles, ballistics, hell, like, that's my favorite. You know, some of us still want to travel around in primitive auto cannon spewing glory, so I'm pretty sure that they will have a variety of weapons there to cater to all the styles of play and pew pew and daka daka. Anxious Confusion was the next to ask, uh, a rather in-depth and well thought out question. Online games tend to make huge gathering spots. Any player of World of Warcraft, EVE, or any MMO will be familiar with this. With trade hubs flowing and literally overflowing sometimes at peak hours with hundreds if not thousands of players on screen, dropping the otherwise immersive game into a slow, laggy crawl. Will Star Citizen have any limits or methods in place to circumvent this, like docking limits? As far as Eric and the company are concerned, the server sharding, sharding system will keep limits on players. So I don't know if this will be instances or just as said with the shards, but this is all to be de to be determined. Um, as far as I know, it still has to be balanced to perfection. They don't want 2,500 ships on screen, but at the same time, if it can handle it, why not? So it'll probably be in you know, a medium balance, and honestly, I don't mind a lot of ships as long as it doesn't unrealistic and there's ship mating taking place outside the hangar, because then that just gets ridiculous. Our next question came from Hermit Boy, and he asked, how will the UEE and other groups respond to stolen carriers? Will they try to recapture whenever you're in UEE space, similar to Concord and Eve? As far as we know, yes, they'll try to capture it, but they're more likely to just blow up your ship and piss in your cornflakes. So, if you have a big fancy carrier, you're pretty much going to be a target, especially if it's stolen. Our next question is from Mariluna, and she wants to know if there's any plans for tools or other kinds of programs to help manage your in-game friends, clans, and alliances. And as far as Eric has said, yeah, of course, work is in development for all this. And there are, there are plans to keep track of all your friendos. So, 
and why not? Because friendos are important. Arthas was the next to ask if we're going to have player housing. Yeah, the hangar module is pretty much your house. So I really don't see the need to building. A... My brain is broken. I really can't even think of something witty for this. <laughs> Moving on. Reebok, ag uh, Reebok again wanted to know, will that we be able to interact with the environment in combat? So similar, I guess, to like an FPS with explosive barrels conveniently lined everywhere. Uh, as far as I know, there will be upgrades to help you find these kinds of environments, so probably like ion storms or something really crazy that my little bird brain can't figure out right now, so look to the future, perhaps. Next question was from Zombie, and he wanted to know, if you keep mining one planet, the planet will be depleted. Will we have to worry about this in Star Citizen? Well, I'm going to reread what Eric said, given the fact that the Earth is... 4.6 billion years old, if we plan to somehow live for about 5 billion years and Star Citizen lasts that long, yeah, we're going to be shit out of luck and going up ship, you know, up a creek with nothing. Yeah, did, how would we deplete so many planets in such a little time? We are but fleas in the universe. Not even fleas, dust particles, I can't think, think of anything small enough. So yeah, I don't see really the need to worry, although this does bring an interesting point. Eric, or Wingman, you know, and any of the guys, if the devs, if you are listening, if planets and resources don't run out of, you know, their raw material, how do you guys plan to deal with market saturation? Are we going to see somebody trying to sell a hundred thousand auroras because they've managed to amass that many resources to do so? Just a thought. Just a thought. And lastly, we have Kin Shadow. Um, rather humorous video, but his main focus was that it was mentioned in the Death of a Spaceman that you could factor in pilots, potentially sell them to slavery, and, you know, some of us might want to make a living off doing that. Uh, would you need any sort of special equipment, or can you just do this right from the get go? Um, Eric Wingman, you know, said that it's not guaranteed to make the best living, but you could, so this is probably something to be elaborated in the future. And, sorry, Kinshadow, but you, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> that was the end of the forum feedback. In the Wide World News segment, our recent and latest focus is with SpaceX and Mastin Space Systems. They're looking back to the rocket as a modern a modern take and means of transportation to space. With the shuttle program pretty much now shut down and not a lot of other options to get into space aside from you know, bootlegging off the Russians, they've looked into developing their own rocket systems both for exit and re-entry back into the atmosphere. And also on this week in space, on April 9th, 1959, the first seven astronauts, the Mercury 7, were picked to go into el outer space. These were Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, Wallace Sierra, Gordon Cooper, and Deke Slayton. These were considered superb specimens by NASA, Genius IQ, and had awesome cooperation and solo skills. These individuals also went on to be in every other NASA program, including the shuttle program. These pretty much are American and world heroes all around for us all. And this just makes me want to be an astronaut all the more. Other than that, that was pretty much the worldwide news. There was an interview with Brendan Jackson, their lead graphics programmer, in charge of the shader FX, you know, all the important, wonderful gra graphic things we'll get to look at. Pretty much the guy response. well, everyone's responsible for this, but one of the guys responsible for making sure Chris's dream comes true. If you're interested in checking out that interview, it could be watched at Robert Space Industries' home YouTube channel, or on the comm link at their website. 
Uh, three other announcements from the site itself. Uh, citizen cards are now in proof, so I know a lot of us, including myself, have been waiting for these, eagerly awaiting to put them in wallets, laminate, or, you know, glue to your forehead, whatever you plan to do with them. Uh, if you look at the above video, they're now in proof. They're looking really good, and we can probably look forward to seeing them ship pretty soon. And I think Eric said there with Sandy will have something for us, so keep an eye out for that. There's also two new t-shirts now in the store, too, and I'm probably going to look at this myself. So if you guys want some Star Citizen swag, go grab a t-shirt and support your favorite game. And, yep, lastly, Chris will be in Austin next week, so maybe we can look forward to hearing the man himself answer some fan-related questions. Other than that, I guess I now have a juicy interview for you, gentlemen. Well, not a... CIG Dev, I think he's all the more interesting. He's also responsible for some things. Anyways, I'm going to transition. I hope you all enjoy the interview. Well, as usual, ladies and gentlemen, I try to have an interview or something meaty and juicy for you guys. While he's not a developer, he is a man of the same caliber and interesting qualities. If you've watched Wingman's Hangar, you'll notice he's also the gentleman that occasionally does beer runs as well as leaving diabetes-infusing treats. Without further ado, here is Michael Nightingale. How you doing, Dr. Hawk? I'm pretty good, and I'm kind of jealous right now. I'm looking forward to one of those diabetes-infusing treats. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll have to see what I can come up with uh, for the next time. Fair enough. So thank you very much for taking the time to come to talk to me, because I know, as in private chats, it's been mentioned some of the guys are just getting back from GDC, you know, workload's increasing, and, you know, probably should give them a little bit of break and let them work on their mountain of work. Oh, indeed, yeah. I mean, uh, GDC is usually a, a, a time when you come back from it, you so, sort of reevaluate what's been going on, and you say, oh, no, we maybe need, need to change this, or, you know, check up on our milestones and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it, it's been getting busy around the office. Fair enough. So, for those of the fans that actually have no idea who you are, do you mind just saying who you are, etc.? Okay. Well, I am Michael Nightingale. Um, I am a small investor with uh, Cloud Imperium Games, in, in, in turn, Star Citizen. So, you, your face, so people, if they want to put a face to the name, you could be seen in Wingman's Hangar. You, uh, you were in the episode 13, I believe. Actually, I've been on uh, I've been on the videos quite a few places. Actually, um, let's see. There was the there was the uh, pre there was the pre announcement uh, sort of uh, fan gathering at the original GDC Austin where they were interviewing fans. I was in that, and act the actual presentation at GDC. I had one of the questions. I was the one asking. Uh, you know, what does Chris bring from the movie industry to the the game industry again? Let's see, there was that, you know, there was the one I brought the beer before, and then helping out with uh, Moreland at uh, the South by Southwest with some camera work, and then eventually the interview um, that uh, we did at South by Southwest. So I've been, I, won't, I haven't been on as much as, say, you know, Roberts or, uh, <laughs> or Sandy, or, but yeah. Maybe a little less than Mark Skelton. So, w would you say you're like one of those little pillars or like worker ants running around keeping things working in the background? Because we all oh. know coders work better when they're drunk, for example. You know, drunk code oh, yeah. is always 100% better than sober code. Well, actually, <laughs> I tend to have... I tend to be very hands-off, and uh, I'm not there at the office all the time, to, uh, you know, to, to be clear about that. I mean, um, at the office, you know, there is strict work done on uh, Star Citizen and, you know, in the pre-production and whatnot, so, you know, I usually visit the office maybe every three weeks or so just to see how everybody's doing, uh, bringing in something for them, or, you know, talking to Ben about a side project concerning, like, the Wing Commander stuff. Um, you know, since I, I was originally a Wing Commander fan, and I've been on the, the WC News sites a couple of times, so him and I talk about that kind of stuff. But for the most part, I'm not really that much hands-on as far as, uh, no, dic not at all dictating what's been, what's going on, what's going on day to day. That's that's Eric's job. So it'd probably be a 
good question to ask. What do you do? You know, both for the company in and out. Because, you know, sure you could just check in on things, but uh, do you, as a small investor, do they? Is there any actually small role given to you, or is it just sort of a hey guys, how you doing? As well as career-wise, you know, what do you do? What funds the beer, if I may um, be so bold to ask? Um, well, let's see. For me, uh, I am a ex-army veteran, um, infantry, eighty-second airborne, and um, and you know, I did a little bit of investing and uh, got lucky uh, with investing. And so, you know, like these days, you know, I'm finishing up my degrees and um, playing hockey and pretty much enjoying Austin. And so, sort of, uh, you know, Austin's a big uh, game developer city, and so. I've been, uh, you know, uh, seeing what I can do to at least uh, help out some of the uh, development studios here. And uh, uh, Star Citizen sort of gave me a uh, sort of an inlet into that. And as far as with uh, Cloud Imperium Games and uh, Star Citizen itself, as far as my responsibilities, there aren't re honestly, uh, there's not too much responsibility on me. I mean, the responsibility is on them because, you know, I get, you know, I give them the investments to say, yeah, I believe in your project. Here, here you go, and but I'm not one of those investors that says, here's the money, goes away for you know three years, comes back, says, where's my money, and I'm not the investor that says, uh, here's the money, I'm going to tell you what to do with it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what Chris has been actively trying to avoid, and what fans really want to avoid is another sort of. I'm going to just say it, EA or Activision, you know, controlling the development of Star Citizen. Oh, quick news guys, microtransactions and DRM for Star Citizen. <laughs> I'm going to get <laughs> flogged, I'm going to get flogged for that. So, how did you get involved with SC then? Because of course, you know, investments, I, you know, all of a sudden you got, was it just this pile of money, you said, hey, you know, I want to do something with it, most people be the house, or maybe try to mine to the center of the earth. Did you, you know, one day just see Star Citizen and go, hey, I want that? Well, it's th that uh, last one is I, um, well, let's see. I guess the story goes, uh, again, with uh, Ben Lesnick and whatnot, since he was, uh, you know, the head of uh, Wing Commander uh, WC News and whatnot, so I've been involved in that community for a while. And so, you know, uh, the Wing Commander News site uh, shows, hey, uh, big announcement coming from uh, Chris Roberts in Austin. And I happen to live in Austin, so okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to that. And so uh, the guys from the WC news sites come down. I said maybe I should uh, hang out with them, you know, just to say hi, since you know we're all Wing Commander fans. You know, got to know them. Uh, you know, uh, Chris Reed, Ben Lesnick, uh, Ace, a couple other people, and uh, we go to you know making myself as amiable and available as possible. Like I, um, I actually did pick up picks from. Uh, from the middle of nowhere in the park because he wanted to go exploring Austin for a little bit. Picks from uh, Pix's Origin Adventures, if uh, everybody's curious about that. He's got like a little series going on. And so, I'm trying to steer this towards the point, sorry. Um, That's fine. So, pretty much, you know, we saw the presentation, we all really liked it, and, uh, and so, um, I get invited to actually have dinner with Chris Roberts, with him and the rest of the WC News guys, and I'm really excited about it. And so, oh, hey, you know, I get to sit down and have dinner with Chris Roberts uh, at the Iron Cactus on Sixth Street, and just sort of, you, you know, you, you see the presentation. I mean, like people uh, after the presentation, you know, got this, got to have their things, uh, their Wing Commander paraphernalia signed and whatnot, which was cool. But you know, sitting down with Chris and uh, kind of talking with him about, you know what his thoughts were going into this. I mean, this is, you know, at the time where, you know, the website was down, so he's just all flustered about it. But, you know, got, got into talking about, just, you know, what you know, uh, what, what he's thinking about Star Citizen being as far as how ambitious. And, you know, as we talked, it's like, you know, maybe want to give uh, more than what, I, what is uh, offered with the pledges. And him and I started talking a little bit about it. He gave me his card, and uh, about three weeks later, um, I gave them the investment. And uh, you know, it, I think it was after we had made the goal. So you know, I'm, I'm not part of you know part of that push, but uh, everything after uh, a little bit after that is you know what I contributed to. 
Oh, very nice. So, I guess I can say thank you from both the fans and myself that thank you in part for your, uh, by the way, back to the military, uh, sacrifices and contributions both in body and in economical <laughs> value. So, thank you very much for that. So, I can see how that meeting would, you know, drive you to get involved with Star Citizen, but, you know, at what point in your mind did you say, you know, hey, I want to fund this, you know, when did you decide, just as the investor, because, you know, of course you'd see it, but it, was it the concept that he was trying to go for, was it just the way the presentation was pitched, because, you know, I've, you know, I know some people just pitch it, oh, it's Chris Roberts, money, throw it. And then other yeah, people, it's yeah. like, <laughs> you know, hey, you know, EVE isn't exactly the space game I want to be. Or, you know, freelancers, there isn't going to be a sequel. Or maybe I've never been able to do this in a game, and Chris says he's going to be do it, be able to do it here. This is more of a player, like you as a player question. You know, what, what did, you know, the little boy in your heart say, oh, yes, do it, do it, do it, do it. You know, what, what was that point for you? Uh, for me, and the little boy in my heart is very pertinent to this. Um, for me, um, the, seeing the presentation, especially live, and listening to Chris talk about it, I mean, especially like the working prototype, right, in the presentation was just like, a, oh, he's not, you know, he's not just pitching an idea. He's actually, you know, bringing something to the table. And, you, I mean, I mean, yes, it, well, I mean, the, the trailer, you know, spectacular, really good. And the prototype itself, you know, him playing it may be a little bit rough, but uh, you can actually kind of see what he's thinking about just as far as sort of, uh, a, you know, a current generation uh, or next generation space sim. As far as, you know, what he's thinking about is that, okay, yeah, I can look over here. No, these are the, you know, you know, this is the physics that we want to play with and stuff like that. So, you know, having that physical thing right there was a big help. And the other half of it was you know, being a space sim fan for such a long time, you know, back with you know Elite and uh, the X-wing series, tacking on the French, uh, Free Space, uh, Freelancer and Star Lancer and whatnot. So you know, space sims and and Wing Commander, of course. And so space sims have been a big part of my uh, you know of my gaming upbringing, and unfortunately. Uh, some of the uh, smaller indie projects, you know, like Soul Exodus, you know, bless their heart for trying as hard as they did. It just didn't turn out all that well. Right. And, you know, like uh, Strike Suit Zero more recently, you know, a much better attempt. But, you know, still those little niggling things in the back of your head, of, this isn't really a space sim that we, can't, we, we would expect in this day and age. And then, you know, you also think, it's like, you know, Lawrence Holland of the X-Wing series, you know, he's over at Totally Games. They're doing social gaming. He's not coming back. Um, Nova Logic, they're not going to do another Tachyon. The guys at Nairplay, they don't want to have anything to do with uh, a new free space. They're, they're not going to do that. Um, and, you know, Bethesda Software, I mean, they're not going to do a uh, space game, even though they did Echelon, which was a pretty good uh, 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 flight sim. But then Roberts comes along and says, oh, hey, no, I want to do exactly that. And I want to do it better. I want to do something that you would expect for not only for nostalgic stake as far as what I've done in the past to compare against, but also something new and different to say, oh, um, say, yeah, I'm going to be pushing a, you know, I'm going to be pushing tech both technology and uh, interaction to a point where I say, okay, no, this, uh, this is not just nostalgic stake kind of uh, arcade shooter. This is something new and exciting. Yeah, I, I can I can agree in that sense of that when we all saw it. For me, it was uh, I think it was Destructoid. I was late. I didn't get the golden ticket. I uh, was a little sad. But for me, it was more you know cruising the internet's one day and it's oh my god, it's Chris Rock. Money? Where's my wallet? Where's my debit card? <laughs> I need to give money to this right now. So I think you know he achieved that sort of goal, but. Um, for me, I guess the real goal, as a kid, we didn't have a good computer or really anything. You know, I I think I got an Xbox right as it was about to die and a decent laptop right as it was becoming apparent that you shouldn't have a laptop, you should have a desktop, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I've always tried to endeavor, at, like you, to find the things that are worth it and 
I think right now Chris has really appealed to a lot of people, and I find it really funny how the presentation voice that PC games are not dead. And even after that funding or the Kickstarter, there were people I remember seeing or reading about it go, oh no, it's dead, it's dead. And then all of a sudden, 8.5 million, that's, oh, oh, no, 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 uh, yeah, we, we wanted <laughs> some of this cheese. Well, you didn't believe in it to begin with. Why should we listen to you? <laughs> oh, yeah, it, it was such a strong voice at that presentation, which is sort of like, okay, I can get behind this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we all can at this point. So, the, it, this is, brings another, uh, I'm going to sidetrack here, but you did mention that, you know, you go around the office and supply care packages of such, and I think the latest one, as I said, is Wingman's Hangar, and I saw some pretty good stuff there, you know, even a Glenfiddich, I can't say I'm a Glenfiddich fan, but I do like my scotch. You know, what kind of fun stuff do you drop by the office, and how do you make sure that they don't all just pass out and keel over? <laughs> well, uh, the, the trick is in mo good stuff in moderation. So I typically try to do a quote-unquote beer run uh, once a month, uh, you know, at the beginning of the month, uh, either the first or just the first week weekday of the month, and, uh, you know, bring by a couple boxes and a couple cases of uh, beer. Um, good German stuff since, you know, like I said, you know, German engine, German employees, so get with the times, or get with the culture, rather. Wait, what, and, what, about, uh, what about Guinness? Uh, Guinness, for Zane, yes, I do bring him Guinness. Okay. Uh, actually, this last time I did forget the Guinness, so I, I need to make that up to him. Oh. oh. <laughs> but continue, continue on. But, uh, let's see, as far as other stuff, uh, you know, I brought him pizza on occasion, like uh, from Conan's uh, Pizza down here, which I think has the uh, best deep dish here in Austin. Um, and, let's see, as far as other stuff goes, um, I think uh, as time goes on, I'm probably going to be providing uh, a couple of other things, such as uh, some whiteboards and whatnot that can be hung up around the office just to help out with uh, just sort of on-the-fly planning kind of stuff. So, okay. you know, not all treats, but, uh, you know, some useful stuff. Morale boosters, so to speak. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, like, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm with the indie game development here up in Alberta, you know, trying to make my own path. And one of the things I've noticed definitely is when you get to crunch times or blocks, they are the most depressing and... Um, I, I, there isn't even more. It's just depressing moments where you're just blocked, you can't do anything, and you really would just want to say, fuck it, I hate it, give up. And then somebody comes along and just gives you an idea, and next thing you know, it's okay, rinse, repeat the cycle of motivation, awesome, crash, depression, motivation, awesome, depression. You know? <laughs> so, it, it, it's kind of a vicious cycle, yes, but some people really live for that. Oh, I wouldn't deny. I wouldn't lie. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't like that. <laughs> so, no, it's it's good that you are doing something like that because there are indie companies up here that I've know or have heard of that literally just tanked because they've had no support, no social presence, and when you're all alone in the corner of the internet, the internet surprisingly can be a very lonely place, especially if you don't make yourself known. So and lo lonely and or hostile. Or that, and you release Mass Effect 3, and next thing you know, everyone hates you. I, I know some of the guys here up at Bioware, too, so I that's a conversation for, for a different day. I support oh. them. And I, I was happy with it. I enjoyed the journey. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the internet does become a bit of a cesspit at times. So, <laughs> something I wanted to get back to, though. You said good beers, though. For any liquor connoisseurs out there, what do you bring, like... If I were to jump into the Star Citizen office one day, Dr. Hawks there, would I find a Macallan in 20 or something really crazy? <laughs> well, let's see. Um, I, I stay away from the hard liquors. And, and so, you know, the, the, the hard liquor stuff, that wasn't sent in by me. That was sent in by uh, another person. So, But, you know, they do thank you for that. Um, wh whoever sent that in. Um, for, let's see, as far as the beer stuff goes, I mean... I typically go for uh, Heifelweissen's, uh, Doppelbox, uh, some nice uh, Belgians, or maybe some uh, Czech Pilsners, usually. Um, like some Honey Wheats as well from Belgian, at least. Um, 
at least imported stuff. Not so much anything local here, though. I should probably start looking into seeing what the local flavor has as well, because there's a really good beer culture down here, as far as microbrewing and whatnot. Uh, what about, well, what kind of microbreweries would you have there? Um, well, it's, I guess not so much microbreweries, but uh, just like individuals, you know, just brewing their own stuff. And they either sell it like a, a local co-op or they have like a festival going on where they say, well, if you really like this, I can make a, make up a, a barrel for you at a certain price. And, and then that's where you, you know, sort of like a uh, personal brew one. Oh, so sort of like an uh, a la carte of beer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's actually is something I might have to come visit Texas sometime for. As a final <laughs> note related on the liquor before we move on. What would you be your favorite beer? Are you an IPA guy? Are you a stout? You know, if you were to sit down with Chris, what would be your beer of choice? Let's see. Well, kind of depends on the occasion. If it's just sort of uh, going out the Sixth Street, um, I'll usually, well, my my white trash beer of choice is Miller High Life. <laughs> but uh, you know, if it's something like that, you know, like a Miller Light or a uh, Miller High Life or Coors. Um, if it's, you know, slightly more formal, then I'll typically go for maybe an amber red. Um, I'm not so much of a IPA guy, pine cones. I don't really like pine cones all that much. <laughs> but uh, usually, you know, if I had the choice, it would be a Belgian Doppelbach, especially a, maybe a little bit fruity, a little less nutty. But it's a good Belgian Doppelbach is sort of like heaven for me. Well, I've never tried that, so I will have to definitely make a note to try that sometime. <laughs> so, another question I've actually wanted to ask, and this is again more related to player base. Um, mm -hmm. What do you like about Star Citizen? Like what that you've seen so far? We've had, you know, the different kinds of ships, the you know the potential for shipboarding, the exploration. And there's a lot of people that compare EVE to, you know, Star Citizen, mostly just because that's actually probably the closest relationship, or at mm -hmm. least that I can think of. You know, what do you, what do you like about it so far? What do you, you know, when you sit down and play it, what, it, what are you going to say to friends? Well, I like it because of this feature. Well, for me, um, as I said in the interview, I was a very big EVE player. And so, you know, I see the parallels to that, and I say, oh, you know, like player interaction and, you know, self-employment. Uh, finding your own niche within a universe is something that very much appealing to me in, in the Star Citizen sense of, you know, people saying, I want to do this, this is how I do it. The game doesn't necessarily, you know, sort of railroad me into that kind of profession kind of stuff. I, I can fill my own little niche. And, you know, that, I think, creates a lot more player investment as far as, you know, the, you know how much time you're putting into this as opposed to how much time you're just grinding to get to the next level of something, you know, just to say, you know, I need to do this in order to, you know, be able to do maybe two more things. Whereas with a sort of like a self-employment uh, kind of uh, filling a niche thing, you, you know, you have this idea to say, well, I can, you know, I can draw from this, you know, or I can do like deliveries from here to here, you know, maybe arm them. Um, or maybe I can do some smuggling on the side. You're not limited to, you're not limited so much to like uh, game professions. You're just limited to game mechanics, which is a much better situation, as far as Star Citizen goes. Um, but I actually kind of say I'm actually looking forward to Squadron Forty Two more than Star Citizen. Why would that be? For the story aspect. For the story aspect, yes, because, you know, being a big Wing Commander fan, you, you want that grand story to be told to you, and especially with uh, what Chris Roberts is thinking of, uh, you know, uh, taking inspiration from um, uh, late antiquity or early antiquity uh, Rome, and doing all that kind of stuff and you know it's sort of like a little tangential learning exercise of saying oh what about rum do i need to catch up on is it where the references are so you know, you're a little bit more invested and you're paying more attention to it and especially with like wing commanders like i'm also a very big music enthusiast and, you know I'm a classically trained trumpet player myself Good and so you know and you know jazz was a very big part of the wing commander soundtrack you know from uh, Shot Glasses Bar up into you know the Wing Commander 2 cutscenes, and then uh, 
and then it got more a little bit more Charlie Parker as it went into the full motion videos with uh, you know main saxophone and a little uh, accompaniment, and so you know, and having you know playing jazz at the same time during that it was very nice to hear you know a video game actually feature jazz, especially one that you know that wasn't say like a Lucas Arts uh, adventure game where they did a lot of jazz, whereas uh, most other action games and whatnot. You know, were like rock and roll or you know metal or you know just like a synth pop or something like that. Whereas right. Wink, so you know, uh, looking forward to the storyline. Look, really looking forward to seeing what they do with the music and you know hopefully they have you know bar jazz going on. <laughs> and sort of, I, I think those are really, the real big things I'm looking forward to with the project. I, I can agree with you on the music sense. I don't. I know not everybody liked the movie. But as a kid, the Wing Commander movie is actually what got me involved in the universe. Where I oh, saying, yes. Hey. Uh, <laughs> and the Kevin music Arnold, there. Kevin Kiner soundtrack. Yes, it is a very great soundtrack. I mean, if you divorce it from the movie, it, can, it stands on its own two feet as far as the soundtrack goes. Yeah, I really would be hoping if they sort of, you know, snuck that into Star Citizen somewhere or even just like walk in a room. It's like playing on a radio. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> So, my uh, oh, second final question that I wanted to ask is, um, you're a small investor, but if we were to just take away all the bounds of reality, and mm -hmm. I'm going to have to excuse myself because my voice is breaking. <coughs> excuse me. I had a long day of yelling at a job. Anyway, <laughs> anyways, um, if you could just plop down in the seat, you know, Chris Roberts, uh, Eric Peterson, everybody just disappeared, and it's all of a sudden you're making Star Citizen, what would you want to see in the game? What does Michael Nightingale want to do? Because you know, everybody has their own ideas, but only some of them can get through. But why not voice them all the same? Well, let's see. Um, the big, I guess, the big fantasy I've, I've held on to for a long time is the Han Solo fantasy of you know being a smuggler, uh, you know, living on the you know edge of the law and the edge of you know your ship being pieced together. So I guess for me it would be. For for, with Star Citizen, sort of, kind of crafting a, sort of crafting sort of gameplay elements that, um, that you know, uh, cater to a, to a, you know on the edge smuggler in the sense of you know you know you you gotta you know every so often you gotta repair your ship and like you know negotiating with uh, you know negotiating with uh, parties for the, what do you gotta smuggle. And whatnot, sort of like back and forth talks, like in like in Firefly, sort of right. like you know it, it. It's not just you know you, know, you do this, I give you money. It's a negotiation, sort of a tap dance and fencing match between people. So it's maybe a little bit more along those lines. But uh, I mean, God, that would that you can make your own game out of that, really. Right. But as far as for for Star Citizen itself, I guess. Hmm, I guess the big thing I would do, if I if I could do one big thing, is probably in probably find a balance between how much players can fuck each other over, I guess, and <laughs> and uh, being able to figure out the balance of that and just and how much uh, you know how much you know, customer service can step in because I think. I mean, a lot of people are concerned about that, but you know, it, there, it, that's a definite kind of delicate balance, and that would probably be the big thing I would contribute to most if I could, you know, if I could sit down and I can make that and say, okay, now I need to figure out, you know, pi you know, pirates, you know, shooting, shooting uh, merchants, merchants complaining on the forums about blah blah blah, and, <laughs> and then sort of just if I, you know, that would be the one thing that I would do is just craft that balance so that you know th there is that risk you know and all that because i think just it's the player agency and being able to let players actually interact with each other as opposed to you know interacting uh through a sort of, sort of a garden between each other um because the player agency is the one thing that really makes eve like stand out from any other product on the market and if star citizen can capture a little bit of that player agency where people can't have less 
you know, barriers between them, other players in the game, then Star Citizen is just going to be that much better. Right. So, something you just said, and I'd have to ask, you mentioned, well, screwing other players over. This is yeah. fun and bad. I, I tend to play a Paragon, I like to help out, but... You know, I've played Daisy too, and there's times where, you know, some motherfucker needs a bullet in the face. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> you need... um, so that's something I want to ask. Are you more along the lines of a goon swarm individual? <laughs> if you're familiar um, with what I'm talking about. No, I am. Um, okay. Actually, I am more of the long lines of the Guiding Hand Social Club uh, member. If, uh, if you remember old stories like Murder for Hire, uh, the Muriel assassination... Uh, stealing uh, titans, warp theft, those right. kinds of things. Right. But doing it with class and style, as opposed to sort just of like being a dickhead. <laughs> as, as opposed to you know just you know going in stealing, disappearing. No, you just say, oh yeah, no, I stole this. You can come and get us if you want. That's our calling card. It would be interesting eventually in Star Citizen if you know I. I it's Goon Swarm was one of the things I've always read about just because I enjoy them and I wouldn't honestly have a problem doing it. You know, if Star Citizen comes on and be like, Yeah, we're gonna crash your market just just and then even the game dev saying, Oh yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> Whoa, what? Yeah, we're giving them permission, to crash the market. See what we care. <laughs> so, I mean it, with it, that and uh, with that there's, I mean, obviously, for the scope of Star Citizen, it's sort of, you know, we're much smaller team, much smaller scope, so there's probably going to be a little bit more uh, customer service and game master, not so much interference, but uh, involvement, just as far as uh, making sure that you know the market doesn't, you know, like I guess the economic market doesn't skew so far down that uh, you know everything's dirt cheap or everything's just like nosebleedingly high. So you know that way, I guess, like for example, NPC markets can kind of adjust their prices as the baseline so you no know, I mean but operating as sensibly as um, like normal markets do so that way the players can dictate a shift in the market but you have also you know a baseline to say a baseline of standard like a real market actually kind of works yeah that makes that makes sense but as far as like a goon swarmy kind of thing you know you know, they're good at what they do. They they have their own kind of fun. And just to be honest, it, it, if it wasn't them, it would be somebody else. And so at, at least you know their name. Right. So any sort of closing comments or concerns? Because it's getting to the point where I might have to do a cutoff here. <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> if not, we could, not a we could We could talk about this all day. And honestly, I would... I really would, because there are some good memories, both in EVE and a lot of other games. Oh, definitely. But if you want well, to do I... any shout-outs or, you know, last-minute uh, address a concern or anything, so... I guess, uh, from, you know, development, from the, uh, from the house in Austin, uh, with Peterson and, like, the rest of the development team, they thank everybody profusely for backing this project and continuing to, um, you know, uh, back the project through you know the the post uh, fundraiser thing, and for sending in like you know, all the treats and all the you know the gifts and whatnot. They thank you so much, and your continued support is well appreciated. And they look forward immensely to showing off what they have in the future. Well, I think that's a wonderful note, everybody. This has been Michael Nightingale and Dr. Hawk. I'll be signing off, so you all take care and fly safe. See you next time on Star Citizen FM.